Okay, so our webinar is uh, going to start momentarily. We'll give people a couple of minutes to join us. We don't always have everybody on the tick, so we'll give people a couple minutes here. So people are coming in. And we'll give them another minute or so. And then we'll start. So people are joining us. We'll give them another minute or so, and then we'll, we'll start our program. Okay, so I'll do a little introduction here. Uh, as uh, more of our participants join us. So for those of you who haven't been to other uh, programs in this series before, uh, my name is Nellie Brown. I'm a certified industrial hygienist and I direct the Workplace Health and Safety Program, which is part of the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. I'm part of both uh, ILR outreach uh, as well as uh, our Buffalo uh, CoLab. I'm joined today by two colleagues, uh, Stephanie Olszewski and Veronica Moore. Uh, Veronica will be handling the Q&A. So I'd like to ask if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A. Uh, it's so much easier. She has only one place that she needs to watch uh, for questions. Uh, remember, um, I can't see you if you raise your hand, whatever. So please put your questions into the Q&A and she will feed them uh, to me uh, during the program uh, as appropriate. And uh, we'll be able to uh, hopefully uh, answer um, a lot of your questions uh, during the program. Uh, I am also able to uh, stay um, a little bit after the program uh, ends if you want to uh, discuss any issues further. So uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, start my program. I'd like to say special thanks to the Worker Institute uh, for supporting uh, our series uh, on these various issues in health and safety. Okay, so today uh, our topic uh, is going to be on shift work and issues of long hours of work and fatigue. Uh, so many of these issues, of course, contribute to sleep deprivation and chronic stresses uh, in people. So we're going to take a look at this issue from several points of view today. <clears throat> our topics uh, will include looking at the effects of shift work and uh, our body being, uh, in essence, what we call desynchronization. Uh, where uh, it uh, is not uh, in rhythm with, of course, our usual uh, being awake during the day, asleep at night kind of cycle. And uh, so we're going to take a look at what we call our circadian rhythm and what desynchronization really is like uh, as a long-term stressor, because it does take toll uh, on people's health. So we'll take a look at those aspects. We'll look at adverse health effects. Uh, as well as uh, uh, an issue of work hours and occupational exposure limits. Because a lot of people, you know, are really uh, working unusual hours these days and our occupational exposure limits were not really set up to address that, except with, with a few exceptions, uh, 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 really they're not. There are also behavioral consequences and social consequences. We recognize that when people are very uh, tired and sleep deprived and so on, they're more prone to errors and accidents, they're more likely to rely on a little bit of chemistry to help them get through all of this, such as food, drugs, and so forth. And there are, of course, social consequences when people are awake uh, versus asleep at times that are not 
matching those of their family and friends and what that can mean for us as social uh, isolation and for uh, uh, causing difficulties with uh, our family um, and work family balance. We'll take a look at ways we can reduce the impact of shift work and long hours of work. And we'll look at that from two points of view, uh, what the employer could do in the workplace and what the employee can do for, for uh, self-care and managing issues. So let's sort of dig in here. I always like to ask people, how do you feel about your own uh, habits and life? Do you feel that you are a lark, a morning person? Do you feel you're more of an owl or a night person? Are you somewhere maybe in between? Uh, I always think uh, we have some idea about what we feel naturally uh, is uh, our good hours for us to be awake versus asleep. Uh, and uh, it can be uh, an interesting challenge, not just in the workplace, but of course at home. Uh, I'm a, a lark married to an owl, and uh, there are little compromises that often have to be made here. So let's take a look at sleep anyway. Why do we sleep? You know, if you look at the uh, earliest work on sleep, uh, you tend to find that uh, people tended to believe we're lying there unconscious doing nothing. And that's not really the case at all. In fact, in many ways, uh, our bodies and especially our brains are more active than they are when we are asleep. And as we learn more and more about what sleep is for, we begin to realize that there is a lot of intense activity going on uh, in the body and brain. So just to take a look uh, at uh, this graph, notice that uh, as we sleep uh, uh, for, say, uh, eight hours, which uh, hopefully most people are getting somewhere between eight and nine, we would hope, um, we, uh, we actually alternate into various stages of sleep, sometimes very close to being awake, uh, other times um, um, so deeply asleep that if we have to wake up at that time, like with uh, an alarm clock, uh, we wake up sort of groggy and uh, feeling as though uh, our, um, uh, we're working underwater <laughs> almost because it's so difficult. Uh, to, um, uh, to come awake when we're in deep stages of sleep. Now notice when we first fall asleep, notice the expression fall asleep, uh, we drop rather quickly into a deep stage of sleep. Sometimes we are uh, so uh, relaxed, our muscles sort of relax so completely that we have uh, the fear that we're falling uh, in a hole and we wake ourselves up with, uh, with that. So um, we recognize this expression of falling asleep. Now notice through the night, uh, we uh, seem to cycle through a variety of different depths of sleep, sometimes very deeply asleep, sometimes very shallowly awake. We do spend part of the night in a portion of sleep we call REM, which stands for rapid eye movement. And when researchers first began studying sleep, they noticed that people were at some stages uh, during their sleep cycle, uh, um, their eyelids were closed, but their eyes seemed to be working, walking rapidly back and forth and moving very quickly. And so they recognized there was something unique going on here. And we'll take a look at what that is. Now, believe it or not, your body actually cycles through a number of different sort of self-diagnostic routines uh, so that uh, it uh, uh, literally turns on various body systems, checks to make sure things work. Uh, and believe it or not, you can go through sexual arousal several times through the night. So the reality is that a lot of sleep is devoted to checking the body. And in the first hour and a half of sleep, we secrete quite a bit of growth hormone and we do a lot of tissue repair. And at first, the researchers used to think that tissue repair was really the principal reason why we sleep. But that's turned out not to be quite the case. <clears throat> what we found uh, in uh, our research nowadays is uh, that uh, we actually uh, spend uh, a lot of our time sleeping during doing brain housekeeping. And uh, due to the various scanning techniques we have available nowadays, we're able to observe that uh, when we sleep, our body is actually engaged in a very intense activity that uses quite a bit of energy. We're actually expanding channels in the brain, similar to our lymph channels in the rest of the body, and we're pumping the brain's waste products into these channels so they can be sent elsewhere in the body uh, to be broken down and disposed of, et cetera. So in essence, uh, it's this process of cleaning out the brain's waste products that really makes sleep feel as though it is restorative for us. So if we don't get enough of it, we don't really feel very rested. And we think that this is a lot of what sleep's basic purpose is for, 
It's really for the brain to recover from all the intense activity it does when we're awake. But the problem is that pumping out these waste products takes a lot of energy and it would compete with consciousness. So it can't be done while we're awake. So we need to get enough sleep so the brain can do a lot of this. We also have other things that we do when we're sleeping. <clears throat> For example, when uh, we are sleeping, we spend part of the night, as you observed, uh, in uh, uh, what we call REM. So what is happening really during REM? Well, <clears throat> during REM, we form a lot of uh, our memories. Uh, we actually um, uh, are making uh, new neural networks or uh, we are firing up older ones. And of course, firing up older networks uh, helps to retain memory. And uh, while we're doing this, uh, sending energy through a lot of these older neural networks to keep them repaired and, and working, it tends to make us throw a lot of information together very randomly with no rhyme or reason, with no rational thought. And as a result, we dream. And during REM, our dreams tend to be pretty intense and often rather strange. Um, now, we do, in fact, dream during non-REM portions of our sleep cycle, but our dreams tend to be rather mundane, and they're about ordinary, boring kind of things we do during the day. Uh, but uh, this ability to fire up old memories and keep them active is a very important uh, necessity uh, for us to remain, of course, uh, healthy and to keep memory going. Now, also during REM, we organize our ideas. We literally attach new learning to existing neural networks. Uh, and uh, this is why as we get older, it's actually easier to learn things. The idea that you can't teach an old dog new tricks was disproved quite a while ago. Uh, so if you're not aware of it, it's time to uh, jump on the bandwagon here because we really do better. You know, when we're little kids, we have to get a lot of sleep and a lot of naps. We have to spend a lot of time building all these networks from scratch. But as we get older, all we have to do is add the new stuff to the things we already know and to existing neural networks. Now, the nice thing about doing that, of connecting new learning to older information is that you can also exploit that uh, to solve problems during your sleep. So it's not unusual if you feel that you wanna to try to solve something, uh, you can basically, uh, as I do, I like to keep the paper and pen uh, on the nightstand and you can just say to yourself, you know, hey, I'm going to sleep on this. I'm not getting any, any uh, solutions right now. I'm going to sleep on it and see if I get any ideas. And sometimes you'll wake up with some through the night that you can jot down. Sometimes you can uh, wake up in the morning and find that you have some solutions to your problem. Now, we also find during REM, we're busy replenishing the brain supply of neurotransmitting chemicals. And this is very important because what you might not realize is that when we are uh, emotionally uh, overwrought, uh, very excited or worried about things, in other words, our emotions very intense during the day, we break down these neurotransmitters at a faster than normal rate. So we need enough sleep to replenish them. They are essential for learning and memory to perform. So let's think about this. <clears throat> How many hours a night do you sleep? Are you getting your full age or maybe even a little more than that? Are you getting by a lot less? Now, how do you know how much you really need? Well, I would say to you that if you're off work for a little while, not just a weekend, but say for a week or so, <clears throat> pay attention to what happens after the first two nights of sleep. You know, how are you doing for the rest of your days off? How many hours are you really sleeping? Because then you'll have a good idea of what your body really wants. <clears throat> now, some people really do need uh, only five uh, hours of sleep, but most of us really need a lot more than that. So when you think about this, if you're a person who, say, needs eight hours, but all you're getting is six, then you're missing, uh, as it turns out, quite a large chunk of REM. And this is a very important situation because the reality is that a very big chunk of our REM happens at about five and a half to eight hours of our sleep cycle. And if we're missing a chunk of REM, we are not doing all those things that we need to do when we're doing, uh, when we're in the REM portion of our sleep cycle. <clears throat> now it is true that for people who truly do need less than eight to, to nine hours, uh, their REM can be squeezed into that shorter amount of time. 
And that's if your natural need is for less. But if you need more, you're not getting it. You're suffering from a loss of the REM. And keep in mind, there are some people with genes in which their need for sleep is actually very short. Uh, and, but that's only about 5% of the population. And they can actually get by on about four hours, amazing as that seems. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, uh, some indications of sleep deprivation. One of those indications is how fast you fall asleep. If you're actually getting enough sleep, typically it will take you somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep. If you're falling asleep very quickly, you find yourself falling asleep at the drop of the hat, uh, you know, uh, waiting for a traffic light to change, uh, just sitting, uh, vegging out in front of the television, oh my, <laughs> you might not be getting enough sleep. That's a very common indicator. So let's take a look at what is going on here and what is the issue with shift work and some types of work schedules. Well, we have in the brain a, a master clock. Some people like to call it a third eye, uh, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And we call it the master clock because it actually is attempting to synchronize activities that happen throughout the body. And a lot of our body organs and tissues do have their own uh, clock, so to speak, uh, and their own uh, daily or circadian rhythm. The word circadian literally means around the day. <laughs> so that's the expression we use, of course, for talking about how things vary uh, and change on a 24-hour cycle. Now, believe it or not, uh, we have discovered that in the back of the eye, uh, there are more than just rods and cones. There are also some specialized neurons that simply respond to day and night cycles. They work even in the blind, provided, of course, that you did not get eye damage uh, such as a physical injury, as has happened sometimes for people uh, in the military. And now, these uh, help to feed information to the brain to tell us when it's, of course, light and dark. Now, we also have uh, a, a clock uh, and circadian so sorts of rhythms that happen in other body organs. And we're just going to give you a chance to look at a few of these. We have clock genes, believe it or not, in the heart, which tend to signal the heart uh, shortly before dawn, uh, to prepare it uh, for coming awake and for its, of course, intense activity of the day. We have a clock in the liver, which regulates our production of glucose and fatty compounds and, of course, regulates their release into the blood. We have a variety of different uh, uh, clock genes in our fat cells so that our fat tissue, if it's disrupted, can actually release some stored fat uh, into the blood uh, at times of the day that may not be very useful for us to maintain our uh, appropriate metabolism and body weight. We have uh, clocks in the kidneys, uh, which of course uh, regulate uh, our um, uh, ions such as sodium and potassium and chloride, which of course function to regulate blood pressure. We also have a clock in the pancreas, uh, which is where of course the uh, insulin is being released, which moderates the blood levels of glucose uh, from the liver and of course our ingested food. So the master clock is coordinating all of these different activities. You can get an idea that once we throw a spanner in the works and we disrupt uh, our circadian rhythm here, we are really disrupting a lot of body systems and interrelationships. So just a quick look at a couple of things here in terms of what their rhythm is like. Uh, so if we looked at two days of circadian rhythm in the body, uh, we can see there are several things going on that are really very important uh, and when disrupted become uh, literally very dangerous for our health. Now, I want you to observe that the body temperature changes. Our body temperature drops quite a bit at night when we're sleeping. And of course, slow, lower temperatures mean slower chemical reactions, including in the brain. So alertness, of course, declines. If you're trying to stay awake at that time, it's gonna be pretty difficult. Notice where we secrete growth hormone for tissue repair. That happens very early in our sleep cycle. So it's not difficult to get enough sleep really to repair tissue, that's pretty easy. Now, cortisol hormone is uh, an alertness hormone and it tends to rise in the early hours, making us come alert and awake and it drops through the day making us then eventually wanna to go to sleep. It's not supposed to stay elevated all the time, but when we experience a chronic stressor of any kind and that includes chronic sleep deprivation, it can stay elevated all the time. And we can't really deal very well with that. It disrupts many body systems and it makes us cranky and irritable and so on. So uh, when we look at what this then means to us, 
later as we start to work our first night shift. Oh my. So take Sally, a look at what happens here. Yes. You have a question. How do I find out the amount of sleep my body needs? Hmm. Well, to find out how much you really need, as I said, one way uh, that's uh, easy uh, is to take a look when you're off uh, work for more than say a couple of days uh, and ignore the first couple of nights and then see what happens the nights after that. How many hours are you really really uh, uh, asleep? And then you'll know a, a lot about your body's demands for that. There are also um, some uh, other tests that are available too, but they tend to uh, ask questions that look at uh, how easily you fall asleep and under what conditions you fall asleep uh, to see whether or not uh, you're actually uh, falling asleep very rapidly or under certain conditions where you're not being very well stimulated, such as the passive nature of watching television, um, which can give you an indication. Again, if you fall asleep very rapidly, you probably are being sleep deprived. And it's time to take a look at ways you can improve your sleep hygiene. And we'll be doing that in today's program. So maybe it'll give you some ideas of some things that might help to encourage a longer uh, and more restorative sleep. Okay, so here is what happens then when we have our first night shift. Notice that we're trying to stay active, <laughs> uh, being awake, working at night. Our body temperature tries to drop some, which of course means that our alertness uh, and uh, our brain chemistry slow down a bit with that lower temperature. And here we are somewhere around either three to 5 a.m. or four to 6 a.m., it depends on the person here, uh, where our alertness really crashes with that lower body temperature, but we're still trying to stay active. And this is where it's very difficult for us, uh, where that part of the night shift becomes the worst for alertness. Uh, and so getting adapted to changes in schedule can become very difficult. Uh, and uh, we can be, in essence, at a greater risk of accident or injury because our alertness is really plunging. So let's take a look at what we're really talking about here. If we routinely even sleep at the wrong times compared with normally humans wanting to be awake during the day and asleep at night, then it throws the peripheral clocks and all these different body organs and systems out of sync with the master clock in the brain. Now, once they've been disrupted like this, these different systems take their own uh, time uh, to reach your new rhythm of when you're going to be awake and asleep because you can eventually reach a new rhythm. Now, in the slowest systems to actually adapt to your schedule change tend to be uh, in uh, um, the uh, liver uh, function, uh, enzymes and so forth, and of course, uh, repair uh, to the bone. Now, a lot of our body systems will resynchronize in about oh, uh, 10 days or so. But these two systems here, the liver and the bone repair, seem to be uh, kind of slow to get caught up. So once we disrupt the cycle again, anywhere between those 10 days and three weeks, uh, we disrupt it in less time than that, the body tries to adjust again. So if we're really you know, shifting around, say, every week or so, then the body just can't seem to catch up. So what does that mean for us? Uh, over time. And one of the things that is really uh, difficult here is getting enough sleep. And for many people, sleeping during the day is a real problem. And I just want to give you this as a study of just one individual, so you can get an idea of what's going on here with this person. Notice in the first uh, figure, the person is uh, uh, sleeping at night, and uh, we let them sleep as much as they need to. So let's take a look at what happens if the night is noisy. Notice the person is sort of jerked awake numerous times as you see these spikes uh, happening and uh, of course sleeps less. <clears throat> now let's look at this same person trying to sleep during the day. Now, if it's not noisy uh, where they live, um, they uh, tend to, it seems, to uh, sleep a lot less. But notice that if it's noisy during the day, as is very typical uh, for other people being awake during the day and doing their normal activities, then people sleep even less than before, and they tend to be uh, awakened a lot, very briefly, by all these noises that they, can, that they do notice uh, in the background. So the problem is that as people try to adapt 
uh, to uh, things like uh, working nights where they have to sleep during the day, it becomes very difficult to get enough sleep and for it to be restorative. <clears throat> Now, the difficulty with the sleep debt is it's not something that you can kind of bank and catch up with. For example, if you're a person who needs eight hours, but you're only able to get six because daylight, daytime sleeping is just not working well for you, your sleep has really been deprived by two and over four nights that adds up to eight. All right. Well, how do you recuperate? Well, in some time off, typically people will sleep, spend more time in deeper uh, sleep um, uh, levels over one to two nights. Sometimes the person sleeps a little longer, but unfortunately, they're not catching up. I mean, they're not making up all those eight hours of lost sleep. So a sleep debt becomes a chronic stressor, and this becomes a difficult problem for a lot of body systems until eventually a lot of things will show up in which our health is paying the price. So chronic partial sleep deprivation, this is a long-term risk factor, and it shows up with a number of problems. So I've condensed a whole bunch of studies to give you a sort of general idea of what's going on here. We do see people with chronic sleep deprivation experiencing a lot more cardiovascular problems. They also tend to gain more weight. The body tends to make more fat cells. And of course, weight gain can, can also uh, increase cardiovascular issues as well. We see chronic stress uh, causing people to be more prone to infections, have little illnesses, they have difficulty shaking. They often develop digestive problems, acid reflux, problems with constipation or diarrhea. And of course, this eating at different times, the body doesn't know quite what to do with that. It throws a number of clocks out of sync and people are more likely to experience uh, altered response and regulation for glucose and can lead to diabetes. We also see chronic stressors reducing fertility. There are effects here on a variety of hormone interactions and we tend not to make uh, the um, reproductive um, systems hormones as well. We tend to find that the blood's level of plasma antioxidants decreases, which means we're not as good as repairing DNA damage from uh, oxidative chemicals that we either take in from the environment or which appear in our food. And as a result of a lot of this kind of, uh, of work, we tend to find that the IARC, which is part of the World Health Organization, International Agency for Research on Cancer, has listed shift work as a probable carcinogen. And among the things they feel is, are, are very uh, interesting to look at is that in animal studies, there are two genes that control the cell's circadian rhythms, which also function as tumor suppressor genes. And it's the loss of this tumor suppressor function, which can happen with disruption of our normal light-dark cycle, that can allow tumors to become more aggressive. So we think we not only have studies on this, but we also think we understand the mechanism by which this might occur. We also recognize that there is an increased breast cancer risk. There's very large studies on this one, which look at people working nights and as well as rotating shifts. And you tend to find that after a couple of decades of doing this, this constant exposure to the blue end of the spectrum from fluorescent and halogen lights is disruptive to the melatonin production. And there's a melatonin estrogen tumor suppression interaction here, uh, which we think we've uncovered that may explain it. <laughs> now, the risk here, some people think is rather small. It's a 36% increase in risk for breast cancer. But when you think about it, Obesity uh, is a 50% risk and family history to hundreds. So 36 doesn't sound so trivial anymore, but it does suggest the need for women who work night shifts to be particularly prudent at making sure they follow their breast cancer screening recommendations so that they're, they're getting early enough mammography and regular enough to capture this problem early on if it should develop. Okay, now if chronic stress is not showing you enough things here with sleep deprivation, we also find that chronic stress can have an effect on the brain beyond just our issues of alertness when we're trying to stay awake in the night shift. We have seen chronic stress decrease the rate of new nerve cell production in hippocampus. This is a part of the brain that deals with, uh, with um, uh, memory and learning and which uh, is involved, of course, in helping to put short-term memories into long-term storage when we sleep. And unfortunately, as a result of this, the hippocampus begins to, over time, shrink in size. This is believed to be one of the mechanisms by which people can experience depression. 
And of course, uh, declining uh, size of the hippocampus can cause difficulty with uh, learning and remembering even for things that should be habitual parts of our daily routine. Now, it is possible to turn this around. There are things we can do for ourselves that can regrow the hippocampus. <clears throat> Now, the problem with this chronic sleep deprivation is the body can sometimes begin to take its own revenge here. And one of the things it does is shut us down. Uh, we call these micro sleeps. So when we're really pretty badly sleep deprived, uh, our brain can actually just spontaneously shift into sleep. Uh, I mean, literally turn us off. <clears throat> and the sleeper you are, the more rapidly and frequently this can occur. Now, these episodes can be very, very brief. I mean, really last only seconds, or they can last for a few minutes. The problem is that we're really being shut down while we're doing other things. You can be standing up. You can be operating machinery. So you can understand how dangerous this can be where someone just nods off uh, and they're uh, you know, driving a truck or operating a piece of heavy equipment or operating a piece of machinery and so on, uh, that uh, this can be really nasty. So I don't think it's surprising to find that sleepy shift workers are more likely to be involved in accidents. And if you look at some of the OSHA data, which they do publish that looks at uh, ac accidents, injuries, et cetera, in relation to the shift the person works, and you can actually see uh, that uh, injury rates are 18% higher during evening shifts and 30% higher during the night shift. <clears throat> Our alertness is down, we're not doing as well. Now, this, of course, has also been estimated to cause quite a bit of, uh, of uh, expense uh, for workplaces. And when you look at some of the fatigue-related uh, lost productivity costs, uh, these are well uh, over $100 billion annually. So yes, it does take a toll. Now, <clears throat> some studies have begun to say to us, you know, when we're sleep-deprived, we're really <laughs> no different in alertness and coordination and response time than someone who's actually drunk. 24 hours without sleep seems to produce the same types of behavior and slowed responses as someone's blood alcohol level of 0.1%. Uh, losing two hours of sleep from your eight hour sleep schedule is a similar impairment to having two to three beers. So yes, uh, this is indeed a very significant issue when you look at it in terms of the workplace. And uh, as I was saying earlier, this idea of being sleepy at the wheel is again, very dangerous. Uh, I, uh, when I'm often uh, driving on highways like the New York State Thruway, and I will see the, the Thruway road take a turn and I'll find these rubber tracks just continuing straight off into the woods. And I say to myself, oops, there's someone who's probably sleep deprived. Uh, you know, some 30% uh, of, uh, of uh, our civilian workforce uh, reports that they're getting an average sleep duration of under six hours per day. And that's not what we're seeing as what the genes for uh, uh, little sleep requirements tell us. Most of us need a lot more than that. And we think probably 20% of our vehicle crashes are linked to drowsy driving. I also wanna draw your attention to one other thing. You never really wanna use the recirculated air uh, setting for the um, uh, HVAC in your vehicle. The problem is <clears throat> that you exhale carbon dioxide, and if you just keep the air on recirculation, you will build up that CO2 to reach the point where it begins to cause drowsiness. <clears throat> One of my colleagues tried doing this with some air monitoring equipment in his car, and he found that in less than an hour, uh, it was already uh, built up from about 400 parts per million that you see in the air uh, normally up to over 2,000. And this begins to take a toll on our alertness. Now, working long hours also means something else. When our jobs have various types of exposures and hazards associated with them, working long hours can mean a lot more exposure. <clears throat> I will just draw your attention to just a few examples here. Uh, it means that we can have more exposure to chemicals or to noise. Uh, we have longer uh, exposures to stresses of extremes of heat and cold. And of course, physical exertions from very demanding jobs uh, in the musculoskeletal system. Uh, as well. Now, when you look at regulatory limits like our OSHA permissible exposure limits or PELs, they have as an underlying assumption that people work a traditional eight hour uh, per day, five day a week schedule. So the assumption is 
that when we do monitoring for a lot of these hazards or look at various advisories as well as regulations for them, uh, what the assumption is is that people are working this kind of traditional schedule. That is not necessarily what we see, of course, because for a lot of people it's overtime, even mandatory overtime. Sometimes it's compressed work weeks where people might work 10 or 12 hour days. Uh, and as a result, you would see that people have longer continuous exposure and therefore more potential for taking in a great, greater body burden of things like chemicals or dusts or experiencing more damage from noise and so on. Similarly, strains the musculoskeletal system and onwards, depending on what hazard you want to look at. Now, at the same time, we have correspondingly less time off for the body to recover from whatever the hazard was, whether that is detoxifying uh, a chemical, excreting it, uh, repairing the tissue, even if that's possible, which of course we don't really repair the inner ear very well from noise, noise damage is tends to be permanent, and so on. So in essence, more continuous exposure can lead to more um, uh, potential damage and less time off to recover from it. We also wanna draw your attention to the fact that when people are coming and going at odd hours, there are fewer people around. You know, when more people are around, they're, they're in essence potential witnesses and people seem to be safer. But you know, when people are coming and going at night and hours where not many other people are around, they are perceived as easier victims. That's why I tend to remind uh, people that in your workplace, pay attention to this. You may need to look at improvements to security, lighting and so on, at uh, buildings, uh, around buildings and so forth, entrances uh, and parking areas. And uh, it's uh, time to take a little bit of a look at that. Uh, and uh, there are sometimes very simple changes that can be made here that can make a huge difference. Now, uh, spending more time at work uh, or being at home, but asleep when other people are awake, do you tend to feel that you spend less time with your family? And for a lot of people, this is a very serious concern. You know, a lot of times when uh, people are experiencing a lot of, uh, uh, of fatigue and uh, uh, schedules they're not in keeping with the people around them, it raises a lot of issues with the families. Well, one of the things we know sleep deprivation does is it gives people mood swings as well as excessive fatigue. And you know, family and friends may not understand this. They may not realize that the reason why someone is moody or edgy or whatever, or depressed is really because they're simply tired uh, and they're really sleep deprived. Sometimes the spouse may begin to feel ignored or disliked. We do see among shift workers, higher rates of separations and divorces. And children feel neglected. They may think that it's like they have an occasional parent. Doesn't this parent care enough about them to spend time with them? And so these things take their toll on people. <clears throat> now, when we take a look uh, at uh, what can be done about this. <clears throat> so being this is only a one hour program, I can only give you so much uh, of the uh, uh, science and information on all of these issues. But I'd like to take a look at two aspects of what might be done here when we're dealing with fatigue, shift work, et cetera. So let's start out taking a look at what could be done from the employer's point of view. And I'm including in here a variety of OSHA and other well-respected recommendations on what to do here. Now, among the things that seem to help people a great deal is being able to have very regular, predictable work schedules. So scheduling makes a huge difference. And all of these items that I'm going to be giving you ideas about do help a lot with people to organize their work-family balance, still be able to spend time with their family, get to family events and so forth, it are so meaningful. Whenever people can know in advance what their schedules are, they can then uh, you know, balance their obligations so, so much better. It helps them to arrange for childcare, elder care, and so on. Can people leave work on time? Now, I always ask when uh, I'm doing live sessions uh, uh, that are in person with people, you know, when you're asked uh, to work overtime, are you being held over after a shift or are you being called in before the shift? Because for some people, that is really when they are sleeping. Some people like to go home and sleep right away. Other people prefer to get some things done and sleep a little later. And calling them in early means they have to wake up earlier. <laughs> So uh, the real issue here is 
how are we doing this so that we don't disrupt the times that people are actually sleeping? I think it's important to enforce maximum allowable work hours or otherwise a lot of people simply want the money from overtime. And you know, sometimes we have to act a little bit as a gatekeeper and to keep people from working too much. Now, they're one of the things that we recognize very well about the human body is it works best with forward shift rotations. <clears throat> Now, a forward shift rotation, as we adapt to it, the first few days, you know, it feels like we're working, you know, uh, longer than a 24-hour cycle. Our body, however, will manage to adapt, again, if we spend enough days in a row uh, on the new schedule. But if we try to work on a backward rotation of people going from days to midnights to afternoons, the body thinks it's working on a 19 hour day and it just cannot gear itself up to do that. And there's a lot more uh, health costs to be paid here by the body and brain. Now we wanna look at sufficient staffing levels because it's important to have enough people to be able to work decent shifts and not enormous amounts of overtime. And also to make sure that we interrupt people's personal lives as little as possible avoiding emails and phone calls after people's shifts and into their personal time. Now, certainly you might uh, very well uh, say to people, I might send you something, but just ignore it. It's just when I'm getting my work done, but, but for you, just ignore it. You know, we need to have ways that this can be done that doesn't really impact too much on people's family lives. Now, when it comes to tasks in relation to work schedules, I would say to you, you know, you saw what happens with alertness towards the end of the midnight shift. So I would say avoid leaving the most tedious or boring task to the end of the shift because people's alertness plus the boring task, oh my goodness, that's a bad combination. Now, if you're concerned about changing people's schedules, and some workplaces have been running little experiments of going to other types of schedules, like moving from an eight hour shift to a 12 hour shift in a compressed work week type of mode, I would say to you, be very careful about those last four hours. You know, you tend to find people are more likely to commit errors uh, in working those extra hours when they first start out doing that. And even as they uh, get accustomed to it, you can still find those last four hours more difficult. So I would say if you have uh, any tasks that require error-free activity, like uh, managing people's uh, medications or uh, you know, uh, or doing intense quality control inspection or anything like that, then I would say avoid doing it, uh, um, having it scheduled at the end of that shift because towards the end of that shift, we're not doing very well. <clears throat> now, among the things people will say to me in my workshops is that they wish their family was here to hear about, <laughs> uh, about what I'm talking about. So that being aware of what happens to the body what circadian rhythm is about, how to recognize fatigue, all these different issues with work hours and scheduling and coping and so forth. It's helpful to know what to expect. And it's very helpful for families to know that this is indeed a very uh, stressful thing for people to do. And you may have to be a little flexible with this person's waking and sleeping times. <clears throat> Okay, so when it comes to issues of physical and mental demands, keep in mind that people do need rest and recovery periods. So it depends on what the work actually demands of people. If it's indeed physiologically demanding work, the real driver here is recovery for the muscular fatigue. So <clears throat> uh, if this is the case, then we want to make sure uh, that um, we have indeed uh, built in good rest breaks to allow for this. If work is less physically demanding, you tend to find that uh, the restorative effect of rest declines through the work period. Uh, but, um, you know, there's only so much you can do with rest. You really have to look at how, how demanding tasks might be. Now, if the job requires mental vigilance and awareness, you're better off taking short breaks at more frequent intervals. These uh, are really more helpful uh, for vigilance because the mind needs a little bit of restorative time, and that's how we do it. Now, physical exercise can be very helpful for uh, adapting people to uh, shift work 
Uh, and in fact, any time that we want to really stay uh, alert during uh, our uh, off, uh, sh uh, you know, our shifts that are uh, at night, uh, we do want to try to stay active during breaks and not succumb to sleep. So anything we can do that involves some exercise, maybe playing a sport, uh, you know, some places they like to set up ping pong tables and maybe play ping pong for a few minutes during their break, uh, or simply physically walking around the premises. And certainly anything that the employer can do to promote uh, employees being in good physical condition, like providing facilities for exercise or offering discounts for people to go to a gym or pool or an exercise program is helpful. Now, something else that helps to counter uh, our um, uh, tendency to go to sleep uh, during the night shift is to look at lighting. Uh, I would like to suggest to you that you look very seriously at full daylight spectrum lighting. And of course, if you want to save energy, you'll then take a look at LEDs for this. These type of things help to promote the body resetting its uh, circadian rhythm. In other words, having a bright workplace helps the body to think that even though it's at night, I'm really working during the day. <laughs> you're, you're in essence trying to fool the body uh, and the brain. You want to avoid fluorescent and halogen lights because they tend to have a lot more blue end of the spectrum. And because of this, as we saw earlier, they can indeed promote uh, breast cancer development. Now, something that people can do that's helpful, glasses with orange lenses can filter out some blue, uh, blue light and also a little bit of the um, uh, blue end of the green portion of the um, uh, wavelengths. Uh, and this can uh, help prevent uh, the suppression of melatonin at night and uh, can be somewhat helpful for people, especially if you can't do changeover of your lighting right away, you can do a little bit with PPE. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, something else that people who work nights complain about a lot is that they have to stay over after their night shift is over in order to make, um, uh, to do any interactions uh, or make appointments and so forth with human resources, personal benefits, or other services that the employer offers. So I'd like to suggest that you have, say, somebody from these departments, you know, available at odd hours. They don't have to be uh, every day of the week, um, but someone who stays later uh, or comes in early or whatever, so that shift workers have a chance to access these departments the same way that people working days get to do. <clears throat> Now, another thing that people who work nights complain about is there's almost nothing left to eat. The cafeteria is closed if there is one, the, the vending machines have junk food. And so um, I'd like to say to you, wherever you can make healthy food choices available, there are vending machines that can do this now. Uh, and to make sure always that people have adequate access to liquids so they can properly hydrate uh, during extremes of heat and cold stress. Now, there is some technology out there that you might want to explore a bit that help to address fatigue. <clears throat> some of these are wearable technology and monitoring types of equipment, like drowsy detection glasses, uh, hats that measure brain activity, and there are head and facial movement monitors. <clears throat> For example, there's a neat one that people have used to our truck drivers, and it's a little buzzer that sits on the top of your ear, and if your head nods forward suddenly, it buzzes. <laughs> Uh, it has a little accelerometer and it notices that. There are also ways to do alertness measurements of the eyes. Uh, for example, your smartphone can actually measure your pupil size. And there are some, uh, again, places that have researched this and think that this is a great idea. Again, you have to see how this is likely to work. Some people may regard this as so terribly intrusive that it may not be a very successful uh, item in your workplace. There are computer apps that can tell people when to take rest breaks or change their posture, or get up and stretch. There are anti-fatigue mats and so on. Now, what about from the employee's point of view and the self-care things? Well, one of the things I think is very important is to monitor our own health. And of course, even the employer might offer these things too. But I think we also need to make sure we take care of our own health this way. Among the changes we've seen uh, with um, the uh, extremes of uh, shift work and sleep deprivation, you can see why some of these items would be natural. Uh, elevated blood lipids to look at that, those fats, uh, glucose intolerance to try to catch diabetes uh, uh, or prediabetes early on, 
hypertension, um, and of course, mammography and breast exams. And uh, as we'll see shortly, issues with smoking and, and uh, cessation programs. And of course, those are valuable for health generally. Now, what if you think you are getting enough sleep, but you're still tired all the time? Well, it's then time to get a good physical. Now, we do recognize that uh, the problems of being tired all the time can be early indicators of some cardiovascular issues. We've already seen shift work and do problems there. Uh, and also, you may be able to diagnose a sleep apnea problem and to be able to take care of that. So say you're driving home after working all night, try wearing your sunglasses, okay? Because this means you're not getting as much daylight into the back of the eye. And as a result, it won't reset your clock and delay your sleep cycle. That way, when you get home, you're more likely to be able to get to sleep soon. <clears throat> now, if there's one thing that uh, helps a lot is to have a good sleep routine and a good sleep schedule. And one of the things that sometimes people push back at me about <clears throat> is this idea of maintaining your regular sleep schedule for the entire duration of your week, including your days off. I have people who say to me, but on my days off, I wanna be awake when my family's awake. Yes, but look at what you're doing to your body and brain. You're basically kicking your circadian clock in, uh, in the butt again uh, after five days of uh, sleeping during the day, uh, then you try to stay awake during the day, and then you're off for a couple of days, and you kick it in the butt again uh, to go back to your night shift. <clears throat> uh, I mean, this is the kind of problem we run into. So I think it's important to tell your family why you need to maintain the same sleep and waking cycle so that your body stays as many consecutive days in a row as possible, and as many of your body organs and systems can resynchronize and make you feel healthy and rested again. And for example, if you look at the research on people who work permanent evening shifts, they keep the same sleep schedule for their work days and their days off. And guess what? They have a lot less circadian misalignment, a lot healthier that way. Now, we are creatures of habit, so let's harness those habits. If we have a good sleep routine that we can maintain. So, if you're the kind of person who sleeps as soon as you get home after a night shift, a lot of people prefer that, not everyone does, but just make sure you're going to sleep at the same time so it's a regular sort of thing and your body and brain begin to recognize, oh, it's time for me to get ready for bed. Uh, it's helpful to have a specific routine you go through at that time, ways that you relax or unwind, uh, maybe you do some stretches, maybe you like to read for a little while, uh, but, this kind of regular routine helps a lot to make your body feel like it's ready to get to sleep and it starts going along with that. You want to make sure the room is as quiet as possible. Try to insist that people respect your sleep hours. Some people use earplugs to, be, uh, to help with that. Now, of course, you can't do that if you're gonna be on call or you have to wake up uh, for a duty or whatever, uh, but uh, some people find that very useful. And similarly, you want to keep your bedroom a bit on the cooler side and as dark as possible, even if you have to use extra window treatments for that. This again, helps the body and the brain recognize uh, that it's time to go to sleep. Some people will even use eye shades to make it as dark as they can. <clears throat> now, another little game you can play with your body that helps to induce sleep is taking a warm bath or shower before going to bed. I know a lot of people always think they like to shower before uh, they uh, go out to work, whatever, but the reality is you can play a nice game with your body temperature this way. When you take a bath or shower before going to sleep, it literally increases the body temperature about two to four degrees, and then the body temperature crashes. And what that does is it tends to get you into a very deep stage of sleep that's non-REM and very recuperative. And also, if it's chilly, Warm feet help you to get to sleep. So and maybe it's time to pull out that hot water bottle or whatever. Now, believe it or not, if you're one of those people that likes to use things like melatonin uh, for uh, sleeping, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes, uh, what, one of the things that this particular chemical does in the body is it manipulates body temperature. So that is how uh, it is uh, helping to induce sleep and so, yes, you could do that without chemistry <clears throat> simply by taking 
<clears throat> a nice hot shower or a relaxing bath. <clears throat> no, excuse me. <clears throat> Nellie? Yes. <clears throat> I have a question for you from Richard. He said you have convinced him of the adverse physical consequences of shift work, which surely should motivate all of us to uh, institute measures that would either mitigate the harmful physical effects or minimize a number of non-traditional shifts. However, he sees two roadblocks, which he hopes you might touch on. One being the recent Cedar Point versus Hassad case, which advanced employers' rights against takings by the people which can apply to literally any legis le regulation, and the other being the apparent resurgence of the Lochner Doctrine, which could mitigate against any attempt to constrain overtime, except excessive work hours, rotating shifts, et cetera. Can you touch on these for him? Well, <clears throat> um, and address not... their, their harmful effects. Um, I've not looked into these uh, cases, um, so I really can't comment on their actual details, except to say that um, we are seeing people paying a very high price uh, for um, uh, in human suffering for uh, a lot of these kinds of, uh, of, um, of schedules and excessive hours. And along with that, uh, if employers take a look at the actual monetary cost of some of this stuff. A lot of the reasons why people um, want to have uh, their workforce work more hours is because they don't want to hire more people and therefore pay the uh, associated benefits and so forth with that. And um, I also think that there are also problems here with as a society, our expectations have changed, especially due to various marketing. For example, if we expect just-in-time delivery, uh, if we expect uh, to have something by uh, the next day, um, if we um, are uh, expecting uh, that uh, things will be um, uh, shipped to us, or if we work um, uh, unusual hours, somebody has to stay awake uh, to feed us. We have then more and more businesses that operate on 24-hour cycles. And those sorts of things are setting us up for having people needing to work hours to fulfill those expectations. And uh, so in essence, we're mitigating against uh, ourselves on these things. And um, the issue uh, uh, with a lot of people, I think uh, during the pandemic deciding that, uh, well, I'm all worth this, but you gotta pay me a lot more uh, if you wanna hire me. Uh, I think a lot of what we're seeing with this is people saying, look, uh, I'm making a lot of sacrifices. Uh, to do this job, uh, I should see more compensation for it. Uh, and uh, I think these things, you know, over time, they are taking their toll uh, on humans. You know, humans never used to work this much, uh, and they certainly didn't used to work this much at night. Uh, in past uh, eras, uh, we worked more dawn to dusk. It was expensive to have light at night because candles and lanterns and so forth all cost a lot of money. Uh, to use, uh, and uh, people uh, usually didn't uh, work this. If you look at the history of it, that's not what we did. Then we invent the electric light bulb <laughs> and things change a lot. <clears throat> now, uh, if you look at what happened then, particularly with the Second World War, you tended to find that uh, a lot of companies geared up a lot of manufacturing to meet the war demands. And then when the war was over, they didn't want to have machines lying idle. So they began having people work other shifts to keep machines running and still uh, keep production up uh, to increase sales and so on. And so we got ourselves into this. And uh, if anything, we're, it's getting just worse and worse. I'm hoping that as people learn more about this, uh, we'll uh, be uh, more intelligent about where these things are taking their toll on us. Okay, um, moving on, I wanted to remind people about this blue light before sleeping. You really want to avoid these items unless they have actual night setting, which some of them do. Um, you want to avoid them for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes before you want to go to sleep uh, because they decrease melatonin and they delay sleeping. 
And a lot of times people are simply on these devices way too late uh, or for too long. Uh, and as a result, they have trouble getting to sleep and this may be your problem. Now, shift workers, of course, are notorious for problems with nutrition. And there are some researchers who are calling poor diet and shift workers a new occupational hazard. So if we want to try to work with these various body clocks, it's very important to have the food entering the body at the same time each day. Uh, if we can keep that kind of rhythm, then our body can adapt to that. Now, I wanted to draw your attention, not just to the issues of caffeine, but also nicotine uh, uh, along here, because the reality is that you, again, want to avoid these items for a few hours before uh, you want to sleep. Otherwise, the effects are similar. They keep people awake. <clears throat> Now, what about other chemistry like alcohol? A lot of times people think alcohol is a great way to promote relaxation, but the problem is that uh, again, like with anything else, a little overindulgence in this produces easily disrupted lighter sleep, not a lot of the deep recuperative sleep we need. We also find that when people rely heavily on alcohol for this, especially overindulging it, what happens is REM is suppressed in the first half of the night and rebounds in the second half. In other words, it comes back with a vengeance and people often wake up from very intense dreaming activity with sweating and headaches and so on. And they tend to be, of course, rather dehydrated as well, which contributes to the headache. So uh, I like to say when you're thinking about diet and nutrition for, uh, for um, uh, shift work and so on, uh, yes, drinking caffeinated beverages is great for alertness during the shift but avoid it uh, near sleep time. And if you're a person who likes to go to sleep soon after you get home, then think about uh, not having caffeine that last uh, 30 minutes to hour of your work shift. <clears throat> Keep in mind, caffeine also acts as a diuretic and just gets you waking up a lot to pee. <clears throat> now, there are things you can do with food that are helpful. Light to moderate amounts of protein help to keep you alert and aroused. And that can be nice. Uh, if you're looking at what should you eat in the middle of your night shift as your meal, okay? On the other hand, high carbohydrate foods induce drowsiness. So if you prefer to eat, of course, uh, getting home after a night shift, and it's something you want to uh, eat before you go to sleep, then yes, carbs can help you get drowsy. Now, avoid greasy foods. They take a long time to digest and keep people alert, and they often produce a lot of sleep disturbance. And if you are snacking at bedtime, keep the snacks light. Now, physical conditioning does help people to adapt to shift work or increase their tolerance of it. So being in good physical condition. And it also, of course, increases your endurance, makes you less likely to get tired easily. So yes, keeping yourself in good physical shape is very important. And you tend to find that people who are in good physical shape tend to have a larger amplitude circadian rhythm. In other words, they have a lot of variation in the rhythm and it seems to make them a lot easier to adapt uh, to changes in shifts. <clears throat> now, the last couple of things I wanna share with you here. You know, a lot of times people need help with sleep and they really need to go to their doctor before tinkering with body chemistry. There are medications out there which are known to affect uh, the timing of your rhythm and affect uh, circadian rhythm and adjust it. Melatonin and related uh, agonists, vitamin B12 is known to help with this. There are some pretty strong drugs like the benzodiazepines and other sleeping pill medications. These carry, of course, unfortunately, a risk of addiction. And they can be useful for insomnia, but they're not real helpful, it seems, for shift work or jet lag, especially because cognitive performance is uh, impaired. There are also other medications uh, in the hypnotic class and there's slow release caffeine. So I would say before you do any tinkering with your body chemistry, you really want to consult with your doctor and get some good medical advice on these. Now, nowadays, of course, with more legalization of uh, marijuana and cannabis related products, I wanna just tell you a little bit about what we know at this point. Because marijuana has been illegal for such a long time, there hasn't been a lot of really good peer-reviewed literature on it. So I'm gonna just tell you what we know at this point. Now, marijuana is known to promote deep sleep, but it suppresses REM. The THC, uh, or you know, as we call it, uh, in uh, 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 marijuana may uh, decrease sleep latency. In other words, make you fall asleep a little sooner. 
but it impairs sleep quality long-term. And then after stopping using it, it REM returns with a vengeance, uh, just as we saw with uh, alcohol. Now, what about CBD? Again, there's not a lot on uh, literature on this uh, yet. Uh, the studies that we've had so far are mixed and some of them have pretty bad methodological, methodological issues and we're not sure about how good their conclusions are. But so far, uh, what I've seen uh, reported on hasn't shown any negative effects on sleep and maybe there are some advantages here. We know the most common adverse effects from CBD products uh, tend to be dizziness, headache, nausea, sleepiness and drowsiness and decrease in, uh, uh, and, uh, a decrease in appetite, unlike what THC does. <laughs> uh, but uh, these may not necessarily be ideal, but uh, there are, is a little bit of literature suggesting that CBD may hold promise for people who have REM sleep behavior disorder uh, and excessive daytime sleepiness. In other words, whether they think they're getting enough sleep. Now, uh, two items derived from <clears throat> the cannabis plant, Navalone and Dronabinol, uh, have been used uh, <clears throat> already as medications to treat nausea and vomiting caused by cancer chemotherapy. It is believed they may have a short-term benefit for serotonin-mediated sleep apnea and therefore may have some help here. Navalone has been shown to reduce the nightmares associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. Navalone also may improve sleep among patients who experience chronic pain. So there may be something going on there. Now, if you're interested in more sources of information on addressing this issue, uh, OSHA has some very good ones. Uh, there is an ANSI standard, a consensus guidance for safety critical industries that you might find useful. The National Sleep Foundation has a fatigue cost calculator. <clears throat> so uh, I would highly recommend employers take a look at this because there's some real monetary costs associated with uh, just working people too hard for long hours and odd schedules. The National Safety Council suggests screening employees for sleep disorders and offering employees sleep health education. And our American College of Occupational Environmental Medicine has a guidance document on fatigue risk management in the workplace. Uh, and I found some really good things here as well, and you may too. So I'd like to thank you for giving me uh, your attention today. Uh, I'm happy to uh, stick around for a little bit uh, and uh, answer some further questions or uh, chat a bit uh, on this issue. Uh, I realize it is a, a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, intense problem in our 24 hour, 24 uh, seven society these days. So uh, I just wanna say, well, we're not nocturnal animals. So there are some things we can do that are helpful, but I can't um, turn us into a creature that's nocturnal. Oh, thank you very much for the compliment. I appreciate it. I'm glad the, the uh, content was useful for you. This is as much as I can squeeze into an hour. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Cornell regards uh, my uh, PowerPoint slides as uh, intellectual property, uh, but uh, I can certainly offer this uh, program uh, to you. Uh, I do also have some separate grant support that would allow me to provide the program uh, for you if you'd like me to offer it uh, again. Uh, so uh, you can certainly um, email me and we might be able to work out a nice date and time and, and I'd be happy to offer it for you again. Uh, or for your uh, workplace specifically, if you would like. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to say thank you very, very much for giving me your attention today. Uh, I hope you have been uh, finding our uh, health and safety series valuable uh, and useful. And uh, we hope uh, to see you again uh, at a future program uh, in this series. There are still a couple more topics that we'll be covering. Uh, so, um, oh, I have a question here. What is my take on the lifting of wearing masks, especially with the new strain? Oh my goodness. So, so I'm back, back talking about SARS-CoV-2. Uh, well, <clears throat> Um, I tend to feel uh, for um, us uh, in the US, uh, this issue of uh, raising masks uh, really has two sides to it. Uh, I would say, first of all, um, that uh, lifting masks uh, you know, uh, in areas where 
uh, the um, uh, incidence of, uh, of cases, hospitalizations, fatality, et cetera, is low, uh, probably it is very workable. Uh, and I think uh, that individuals for their own risks uh, may still go on wearing masks, especially if they have a suppressed immune system or uh, otherwise uh, are at high risk. Now, uh, if you're in an area where um, the level of uh, infection is still quite high, lifting masks as a mandate is one thing, but looking at it within an individual workplace, uh, work, you know, an employer can still require these um, in uh, the workplace, um, as well as uh, do other um, hazard reduction activities that are valuable, uh, such as the uh, improvements to ventilation and so on so that uh, the workplace is not prevented really from uh, putting in place control measures um, and particularly such things as requiring vaccinations for part of the, uh, as part of the job. Um, so this has been a really tough consideration. I think uh, as we see things going forward, we really have to look at whether new strains coming out uh, have uh, increased transmissibility and not just increased fatality. Increased transmissibility translates to greatly increased fatality just on its own, uh, 10, 11 fold increase literally uh, in, uh, in, uh, in deaths when you have something that's more transmissible. Uh, so it's much more dangerous uh, a characteristic for coronavirus than just being a more fatal illness. And when you look back, uh, for example, at MERS, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, was not very transmissible, but it had a very high fatality rate. And as a result, not being very transmissible, it was more easily controlled and headed off. Transmissibility is really the big worry. So I think we need to keep uh, uh, alert uh, with um, genetic uh, mapping uh, of uh, our um, new uh, variants. Uh, be always on the alert uh, for any characteristics that make this disease more transmissible. But, you know, uh, a lot of people want to get back to normal. <laughs> Uh, as quickly as possible and uh, uh, getting um, rid of mass mandates is one way uh, to achieve that, but it still may lead to uh, more uh, illness, even if that illness is milder. So we have to keep our, our eyes on the strain. And I think we need as individuals to pick our battles. Where do we want to take our risks? Where not? Because I think a lot of people may still want to wear masks and should, and they shouldn't be given a problem for doing so. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you at our next program. Again, the second Friday of the month. Goodbye.